29, verses 17 to 24, and Mark 15, Mark 9, verses 15 to 23. Isaiah chapter 29, verses 11 to 24. Shall not Lebanon in a very little while become a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be regarded as a forest? On that day, the deaf shall hear the words of the scroll, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. Meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the neediest people shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the tyrant shall be no more, and the scoffer shall cease to be. For all those alert to do evil shall be cut off. Those who cause a person to lose a lawsuit, who set a trap for the arbiter at the gate, and without grounds deny justice to the one in the night. Therefore, thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. No longer shall Jacob be ashamed, no longer shall his face grow pale. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, they will stand in awe of the God of Israel. And those who err in spirit will come to the understanding, and those who grumble will accept instruction. Gospel of Mark chapter 9, verses 15 to 28. When they came to the disciples, they said, well, when the crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe. They ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit in him that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. He answered them, You faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. This is the word of God. Pastor John will speak to us today um, on the, one of the costs of COVID. Pastor John. Good morning. Good morning. You all know that I don't usually write my sermons down, but today I did because there's so much detail that I didn't want to forget anything. In 2021, three medical organizations that had primary concerns for children and youth medical care surveyed 7,705 students in grades 9 to 12 between January and June 2021. These organizations, as a result of the survey, warned the nation of an epidemic of mental health problems in our youth because of the pandemic. The same concerns have continued over the effects of COVID-19 in adults as well. The pandemic has wrought divisions between our citizens, created vast social problems of unemployment, deepened poverty, and still raises the threat of mass homelessness because People who lost jobs have not been able to pay their rent in some cases for years. Churches have closed because their congregations could not gather and their budgets were not sustained. Health facilities throughout the nation were tested beyond their capabilities in some cases. Other surgeries and treatments of disease were held off because of the COVID crisis. While other groups were affected, I believe the churches were affected most because we are centered in our discipleship on the relationships we have with others. God has commanded us to love each other and lift each other, and all of that is difficult to do 
if we cannot be together. It is true that we have found new ways of communicating with each other. At least we, through Skype and through uh, Zoom, we can see each other's faces and hear each other's voices. But that's not the same as being together and sharing space together and talking and loving each other in practical ways. We have grieved for the dying, not just because they died, but also because the families could not be with them at their bedsides as they died. It has been a horrendous time for people who care about each other. No wonder we have suffered as a population. To give some idea of the mental health effect of the pandemic in the United States, listen to these statistics. Before the pandemic, the percentage of our population that experienced depression was eight and a half percent. In 2020, it was 27.8%. And in 2021, 32.8%. In the survey I told you about, 11% of youth in 9th to 12th grades experienced physical abuse because the household was under great stress. 30% of those youth were in a household where at least one parent lost their job, and 24% experienced hunger because there wasn't enough food. More than 50% of those who contracted COVID-19 reported symptoms of depression months after having the disease. These symptoms included headache, fatigue, nervousness, and dread. I heard one person on a Zoom call complain about brain fog months after he had been cleared of the virus. Other studies have documented an increase in prescriptions of antidepressants, partner violence, and suicide thoughts. <clears throat> Scientists say that there are two factors that lead to depression and other mind symptoms or mood symptoms. The first is the body's immune response to the virus. Proteins in the way, and I, I won't go to the, uh, the, the protein I'm talking about is called a cyclotene and they're created by the body in cases of infection. A particular type of cyclotene went to work to fight the COVID varieties. But these, these uh, proteins cause the following consequences. Nerve inflammation, disruption of blood to and within the brain, impaired nerve transmission, and an immune cell invasion into the central nervous system. They went into the central nervous system to try to protect those cells against the COVID. It was their way of protecting against the virus, but instead caused additional problems. Now, the reason I'm reporting the medical information to you that most of you and I do not understand is to tell you that some of the problem is how the body itself response to the virus. In one of my earlier parishes, a woman named Pearl came down with what we call lockjaw. I visited her for weeks in the ICU as the lockjaw went from the top of her body down to her feet. No, the other way, went from her feet up to her head. And she was rigid and they had her unconscious. And they told me that the the, it wasn't so much the disease that was a danger, but the treatment itself. And she was 88 years old. Well, I remember coming into the ICU a week later, and I said, how's Pearl today? And I felt like the nurses are walking two feet over the floor. And one of the nurses had a big smile, and she pointed at the room, and I could see Pearl sitting up in her bed, which meant that the lockjaw had Brought away from her major organs down to the lower part of her body and that she would survive. The second cause of anxiety is simply being sick with a disease that is known to be terminal. That causes as much stress as being told you have cancer. Amongst the youth surveyed, 
the incidence of depression and anxiety ran through all categories of sexual orientation, racial groupings, and social status. Ages showed the most stress, and we know why, because the virus was called the Chinese virus, followed by other minority groups, especially the gay community. As Christians, what is our response to this situation? Part of the ongoing concern is what to do to help people who lost their jobs and are threatened by eviction, because that will bring millions of people out into homelessness. Earlier, Sturge sent almost $10,000 to the Strong Fund to help with this problem, and you're, you're to be congratulated for that. But according to the newspapers, even with government help, and that includes county, state, and federal, the problem still exists and is overwhelming. What does the gospel of Jesus Christ have to say about the results of the coronavirus pandemic? In general, the gospel assures us of God's love and the provision of life even in death. Jesus said, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that, they do nothing more. He also said, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. We are surrounded with dangerous dramas yet to be ended. As disciples, it is our responsibility to do what we can. But when all is said and done, we are in God's hands. We can only trust him to keep his promises. But then I thought, that's not enough. There are still people, and I don't know whether anybody in our congregation, I haven't heard anybody speak of stress in Sturge Presbyterian Church. But if there is someone who is experiencing these calamities in, in our physical life, I want to know about it, and you want to know about it, because we need to be with them in spirit. We can now at least sit with them with our masks on and listen and, and help them experience what it means to be with others. If there is someone who comes into Zoom and watches this sermon later on on uh, YouTube, I hope that if they're experiencing some of these things that are a result of the coronavirus, they will contact you or contact me and let us help them move through the crisis to a better time. But it's important for us to understand that the problem is not just psychological. It also involves the body's response to the virus. And that, that is something that we can't control. But we can be brothers and sisters. We can be people who care. And sometimes just being there and do good medicine for people who are troubled. Let's pray.